morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Glad to hear. So we're going to uh, we're going to continue, actually conclude our series on finances uh, and and how we understand the best way to do finances from the Bible. By the way, if you're visiting with us, my name is Sam, and I am the pastor here. We here at Rockaway Community Church have a vision, and that vision is to see more people meeting Jesus Christ, more people growing in the faith, and then more people following Jesus on his mission. That is, that is why we are here. That is why we gather. It isn't simply like a nice social club, right? It isn't just a, a good, kind of a cool, fun place to hang out and just meet other people. It is we are here with common purpose, with a common mission, and a common vision. We desire to see God's will accomplished in the world. And that means more people meeting Jesus and following him on his mission and growing in the faith. And one of the things, one of the ways that that gets accomplished is we gather and we open up the word of God, the Bible. And we, we learn what it is that God has to say to humanity, to us. Not simply people a long time ago, but even yet today the word of God speaks to us, God speaks to us through his word. And he speaks to us about many, many things. One of the things that the Bible actually talks quite a bit about is this matter of finances. Um, we can think of being people who believe and follow God, which requires us to do all sorts of uh, kind of growing in all sorts of different ways. And we think about prayer, and we think about reading the Bible, and we think about um, being in fellowship with one another. And of course, all of those things are good and we affirm those. But the Bible actually talks more about finances than it talks about prayer. And so that's a, it, it's one of those topics that often sort of people are sort of kind of nervous to talk about. We don't talk about money. God talks about money. Um, we saw from the very first week that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. All resources, natural resources, manufactured resources, all things, all money, all sorts of different monetary units, uh, everything that exists, that Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, everybody in it belongs to God. And so all of everybody's bank accounts also belong to God. We like to think of money as, well, this is mine, and then maybe I'll give a little bit of it to God. No, it's all God's. And everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. And then last week we looked at greed, and we looked at generosity, how greed actually causes us to stop flourishing as human beings. It causes us to go inward and to shut other people out. To, uh, as one person in the scriptures that Jesus talked about, a farmer who had a plentiful crop, who decided that instead of making sure that the, the people around him were taken care of, he decided to build bigger barns for himself and to store up more for his own personal security and forget about everybody else that was around him. And then God said to this person in this parable of Jesus, fool, you fool, for today your soul is required of you. God killed him. And he said, look, when you're gone, who, who will have all of this? What good will this do you? You cannot take it with you. Greed does us no good. Greed and covetousness are actually foolish things. And today we're going to talk about something else that the Bible talks about. Borrowers and lenders. Borrowers and lenders. Sometimes... Uh, we will get to a, a point where we're going to open up the Word of God and we'll be in like a really long section. No, can I have you advance that slide for me, please? We'll be in a, like a really long section of the Scripture. Today we're just going to focus in on one little verse. Just one. So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, and we will look at verse 7. Proverbs 22. It's in the middle. 
very simply says this. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. The borrower is the slave of the lender. So I just want to take us to, 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 to take a minute to sit and think about that very simple phrase. The borrower is the slave of the lender. Has anybody in here ever borrowed anything? <laughs> I'll give it back in perfect working condition. Or maybe you borrowed money. I, I have to make this payment. I have to make this rent payment, and I just need a little bit of extra help. Or I'm going to buy a house, and I don't have a few hundred thousand dollars lying around, so I'll go to a bank. And when I go to the bank, I will borrow. Because you don't have $200,000 lying around, or however much the house would be. Right? Maybe some of you do, and you're my new friend. <laughs> But for the most part, that's just not the way it is with people. We just don't have piles of cash lying around. And so everybody at some point finds themselves in a position of needing to borrow. And I would just say this, credit and debt are major players everywhere. Credit and debt are major players Everywhere. We, of course, hear the word debt, and something in us kind of goes, <sighs> I hope. <laughs> because debt should, in some way, I think, scare us a little bit. Because if we get into a place where we owe, and we owe, and we owe, and we can't seem to get out of that, that probably is not the, the preferable situation. How many of you are here today? and you have a wallet or a purse, and in that wallet or purse, you have this little square of plastic about yay big. <laughs> Generally everybody. And that has, how many of you, how, you don't have to show hands on this one, how many of you carry cash and prefer to use cash over against using that plastic? Just think about that. Because we've gotten to a point in, in our culture where it has simply become an accepted practice to not carry cash, not carry uh, actual physical copies of paper or coin money. And we just have these little plastic things that we'll swipe. And it's just, it's just that easy. It's just so simple. And what we are, what we are doing when we, when we do that is we're not handing over something that we're not getting back. You realize that. When you, when you pay something with cash, you have a 50 or whatever, and you hand it over, and you're not going to see that 50 again. Right? With your credit card, it's not the same. With your credit card, it's, I still have it. And so it creates this illusion that I have. I have plenty. It'll be just fine. Right? That's just kind of the way, the, the way it feels. It's, well, I, I, I always have this. And maybe we need to get to a point when, when that bill comes, and it's a little bit higher than we thought it was going to be, and maybe we don't have the available funds to pay all of it, it may come and I'm not saying it's always this way for everybody at every time, but it may come time for us to do a little plastic surgery. <laughs> Break out them scissors and cut that thing in half. Because credit and debt are major, they're all around us. They have become a normative reality in our lives. Everybody's got credit, everybody's got some sort of O. Right, so oh, they owe a little something. So, so that it, it's just become ubiquitous, which means it's just everywhere. It's wherever we look, everybody has this sort of assumption that that's just the way it goes. In accepting obligation to pay back credit, 
you accept the authority of your predator over you. Which is what the writer of this proverb means when he says, the borrower is the slave of the lender. The borrower is the slave. I have taken something from you that you have given to me, and I am now assuming the responsibility to serve you in order to pay you back. I have just become your slave. And, and this is true of anything from, like, I need to borrow a rake, to I need to borrow $200,000 to buy a house. In every case, when you borrow, you have just made a promise to in some way take care of what you have borrowed and to return it. It's not yours. It does not belong to you. If it belonged to you, you wouldn't be borrowing. Right? It's very simple. It's very straightforward. So this is the, the sort of the framework that we're going to use to sort of approach this idea of credit and debt. Is that when you go into some when you go into debt with somebody else, you become their slave. You become their servant until you pay them back. Now I want to talk about four principles of borrowing and debt. I take this from Larry Burkett's book, Debt-Free Living. These are just sort of principles that we ought to have in our understanding when we think about credit, when we think about debt. Very first one is very, very simple. Debt is not normal. Debt should not be the normal way of living. But this is a very easy pattern to slip into. It's a very easy pattern to slip into. Now, some people like Larry Burkett or Ron Blue or Dave Ramsey or some of these other financial gurus, they will talk about sort of, there are obviously some acceptable forms of debt that you just sort of can't get by without. Okay, so like you, like you do want to have a place to live, right? So you buy a house. Well, like I pointed out already, you don't have just piles of cash lying around. So it's sort of acceptable for you to go to the bank and to borrow money to then have a place to live. With, of course, the assumption that you will work on paying that debt. Right? So there, there are some acceptable uh, forms of, uh, of, of credit or acceptable forms of debt that don't sort of fall under this category. For the most part. For the most part, debt should not be the normal way in which we conduct our lives. Because if we are constantly in debt to one, two, or more people or agencies, what has our attention? Them. Right? Is, is there maybe perhaps some form of your attention that first belongs to God? Our creator, our maker, our sustainer, when we are in debt up to our eyeballs, when we find ourselves sinking beneath a, a, a line of credit that we can't live up to, it is very hard to give God his proper worship because we have all of these other concerns that are pulling on our attention. Debt should not be normative for us. Debt should not be normal. Do not accumulate long-term debt. So let's think about this primarily in terms of like credit cards. Okay? So... You've got that purchase that you really after. And you whip out your little piece of plastic and you swipe it, you put your plastic back in your wallet or your purse or whatever. But then when you find that that time of the month comes when the bill arrives in your mailbox and you don't quite have enough to cover it, you're like, well, I'll pay, I'll pay off the minimum. 
pay off the minimum, and it will be um, it will be fine because I'll just carry it over into the next month, and I'll take care of it then. But what you find happens is we become accustomed to a certain way of living, and becoming accustomed to that way of living causes us then to say, well, you know what else looks good? It's like, you know what else looks good? You know what else looks good? Swipe. And before we know it, what happens to us? We have a rising level of debt that we cannot keep up with. And, and here's the crazy thing about that particular form of debt. It's got this thing on it called an interest rate. Which makes it somehow magically bigger. I wish there was something on my bank account that would make it magically bigger the same way that my credit card debt becomes magically bigger. But there isn't. And so I have this problem. I have this problem of I just can't seem to keep up and keep up and keep up with my own habit of spending. And so I accumulate a long-term debt. There are other forms of this that we could probably speak of as well. Well, you know, I... I need to make sure that this part of my family life is taken care of, so I'll just assume this large debt that will take me probably a really long time to pay off. Don't do that. Don't accumulate long-term debt if at all possible. Here's one that uses a technical word. Avoid surety. Avoid surety. Now, a surety is this. I've got a definition for you. It's accepting an obligation to pay without having a specific way to make payment. It's accepting a payment without having a plan. This is really basically just sort of a, have a plan. Know how you are going to pay off any debt or credit that you accumulate. Have a plan. Do say, I will pay off that credit card when the bill comes in full or I will cut it until I can learn to do it well. Form a plan. Or if you are borrowing money from a bank to buy a vehicle or a home, and, it, and it's, they, they will sort of lay it out for you. But here's the long range. Make up your own plan that gets it taken care of quicker. Because in the end, you will end up paying less money for that item you just purchased. And that's the other thing about accumulating long-term credit card debt, by the way, is that, well, I saw something and it was on sale. I couldn't, I couldn't help it. But you accumulated this debt that gains interest, and so you ended up paying more for that item than you would have normally if you just paid cash at its regular price. It's very tricky. It's very sinister, the way they get us to pay extra for things. But avoid surety, which is accepting an obligation to pay without having a specific way to make that payment. Formulate a plan. Be prepared before going into that before going into an obligation, know how you are going to approach it. Know how you are generally, and of course, things will come along that you're not expecting. Of course, that's going to happen. But if you have a plan, at least you have a basic structure to work with. This is this is a really probably the most important one that we that we wrap our heads around as a culture. The borrower has an absolute commitment to repay. The borrower has an absolute commitment to repay. Don't borrow if you're not going to be able to sustain that obligation. Plain and simple. Don't take it upon yourself to pay if you can't But we have this, this sort of voice, this justifying, rationalizing voice in the back of our head. Well, I'll figure it out. It'll all work out in the end. It won't be a problem. It, it'll all 
come together. We say in the theater business, the show must go on. No. Don't rationalize it. If you find yourself rationalizing, if you find yourself justifying, you are going to find yourself in slavery. Because the borrower is a slave to the lender. The borrower Outside of this basic framework is the pathway to being enslaved. And this is the one thing we know about God. This is one of the many things we know about God, I should say. He desires to liberate slaves. He desires to set captives free. Which is why we find passages in the scriptures that says, don't go back to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to the ways. Don't go back to the methods that got you enslaved. Christ does not desire us to be in bondage. He desires us to be free from all of that. So those are four very, just very practical, applicational methods or, or sort of principles or ways of thinking and living that help us to live with that understanding of the borrower is the servant or the slave to the lender. It's important that we understand this very guiding truth. We had an unpayable debt that Jesus absorbed himself. On the cross, the last thing that Jesus says, John 19, 30, it is what? It's up there. It is finished. Now that's absolutely fascinating to our discussion here for this reason. R.C. Sproul in his book, Everyone the Theologian, points out the word translated as finished was a commercial term. It was used when someone made the final installment on a series of payments just as we might stamp paid in full on a final invoice. Jesus' last words are commercial in nature. But they are, of course, also spiritual in implication. Because what we have as a reality as all human beings is that all human beings, the Bible tells us, are born broken and bent away from God. We are born with an accumulating debt called sin. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That's more financial language. Do you notice that? The wages of sin is death. But then it goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Which do we prefer? A wage that leads to death or a gift that leads to eternal, ongoing, loving, blissful, beautiful life in and with God? Which of those two are we going to choose? Which of those two is the wiser path? It's clear, is it not? Does it not make more sense to shun death and to run towards life. Human beings are born with this broken, sinful nature that bends us naturally away from God. But God, in his love for us and in his wisdom, saw the accumulated debt of death and sin that we had and said, No, I will not let this stand. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, which is the passage that we read in Colossians for our scripture reading. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 talks about he canceled the legal charge of debt that stood against us and nailed it to the cross. He killed it. When we say yes to Jesus Christ, when we say yes to God, 
and say, I don't want to live in this brokenness and death anymore. I want the eternal life that only comes, God, from you. Our debt of sin is blotted out, erased, it's stricken from the record. And we live as free men and women in God's eternal kingdom. So we fairly simply notice that indebtedness is not a state in which Jesus wants you to live spiritually or financially. Indebtedness is not the best possible way to live. Because indebtedness is slavery. Because the borrower is a slave to the lender. And because all people are born broken and bent away from God, we are born into debt. We are born into slavery which is where this word redemption comes from. That Jesus Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection redeems us. Do you know that redeem is also a financial term? Redeem is a financial term. Have you ever redeemed a coupon? Same basic principle. When a person would go and purchase a slave in the ancient world, that was redemption. They're redeeming that person from the slave market. What God does in the Old Testament, for example, in the book of Exodus, is he goes to the slave market of Egypt and he redeems the slaves of Israel. <coughs> and he does that through Jesus Christ to you and I, eternally, spiritually. He redeems us from the slave market of sin and death. He does not want people to live in debtedness because indebtedness is slavery and death. And that is why he does not want us to live indebted financially either. This is why debt should not be a normal thing. Because debt says something about what we think about the world and how it works and about God. When we flippantly go into debt, what are we saying? about how we think about what God thinks about the world. That's no big deal. To God, it's a huge deal. Our lives, our, our, our actions, don't simply have practical value, they have symbolic value. Your death has symbolic value for what you think about the world. Are you a person who leans more towards just us I'll just keep going to debt. I'll just take this. Um, I'll just take this line of credit and go as far as I can with that until I can get a new credit card, pay off the old one, and then I'll live under this new one for a while. Or are you a person who says, "No, debt is not the way to live. I will not be a slave." Jesus does not call us to be slaves. Let's talk about some questions for reflection. They're printed in your bulletin. They'll also be up on your screen. Have you ever thought of yourself as a servant or a slave to a person or organization to which you owed money? Sometimes you'll get those phone calls reminding you, by the way, you owe us. That is the activity of a slave master, reminding you, <clears throat> you belong to me. Larry Burkett's four principles of borrowing, do you find the most difficult? What does that difficulty signal about yourself? And those four are debt is not normal, do not accumulate long term debt, avoid surety, which is accepting an obligation to pay without a way to pay it, and the borrower has an absolute commitment to repay. Which of those four do you find the most difficult? What does that signal about yourself? Third and final question. How does Jesus' attitude and action toward your spiritual debt 
by the way, if you found today helpful, if you found what, what was said today from God's word to be beneficial for you, I would encourage you to bring people with you when you come next time. Invite friends, invite family, invite arch enemies, I don't care. <laughs> bring somebody with you when you come back. Because if you found it helpful, maybe they will find it helpful. Next week we're starting a series from the book of 2 Peter. Uh, and we will be in that book on the, all throughout the month of May. And the theme is going to be Stand Against the Tide. Which is, I think is something that we really need to learn how to do well in our culture. Because our culture has a massive power behind it. A tide that wants to wash over us and absorb us. But Jesus would call us to stand against the tide. And we'll learn a little bit more about that from the book of 2 Peter. So I would invite you to come back next week. I would invite you to invite other people to come back with you next week. But for now, let's pray. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you how you make your grace freely available to us. How we don't have to live perpetually in spiritual debt and brokenness and death, but we can come to you and have eternal life when we say yes when we believe and trust in what your son Jesus did for us on the cross. Thank you, God, that you signal to us that we don't have to live in financial debt, but there are better ways to live, and there are better ways to enjoy the life that you have given to us. And there are ways in which we can worship you better, and accumulating debt for ourselves is not one of those. Because, God, we know that the borrower is the slave of the lender. We don't want to be slaves.